Hello and welcome to the Interagency Inter Modeling Inter Analysis Group webinar series. Today we have a new grantee uh, webinar presentation and this award uh, is uh, NCI, a cancer award uh, for one of our U01 um, initiatives. The award is entitled Modeling Bidirectional Signaling and Cytoskeletal Dynamics in 3D Cell Migration. And Dr. Mohamed Zaman is one of the multiple PIs on this award. And his host, uh, Michael Mack, will be presenting the talk today. Michael is in CAM lab at MIT and is in the mod lab at Boston University. His research focuses on elucidating the mechanobiology of cancer metastasis. Currently, he is developing integrated computational and experimental systems to analyze cell mechanics in 3D with emphasis on Brownian dynamic simulations of cytoskeletal networks, microfluidics, and microreology. His, his talk is titled Multiscale Modeling and Experiments of Cancer Mechanobiology. And welcome, Michael. You may begin. All right, thank you so much. Well, uh, my name is Mohammed Zaman. I'm, I'm one of the PIs on this grant and um, Associate Professor of Biomedical Engineering here at Boston University. So Michael and I will be uh, presenting, well, Michael will be presenting most of it, and I'll sort of chime in. Uh, just to, uh, by way of perspective, uh, the goal here is to um, understand cell migration, or rather cancer cell migration in complex 3D environments, where we want to sort of look at the mechanics and signaling at the molecular level and integrate those processes uh, into a migration in 3D. So, so we are looking at temporal multiple scales as well as spatial multiple scales, um, molecular, macromolecular, cellular, and we are doing that in the context of 3D environment. So the way we have sort of structured our conversation today is focusing on both experiments and simulation at the molecular level and how that feeds into the macromolecular and cellular level. So um, I'll just start the conversation and then Michael will pick up from there. Um, let's go there. All right, uh, so tumor metastasis is one of the biggest challenges in modern medicine, uh, not only in, developing, uh, in developed countries, but also in developing countries where the cancer rates are increasing. There are approximately 7.9 uh, 7 million cancer-related deaths in, in 2007. In many developing countries, actually, this number continues to increase. Metastasis is a process by which tumor uh, cells go from parent tumor to distant sites in the body accounts for nearly 90% of such deaths. This process is actually a multi-step um, coordinated process um, associating large spatial and temporal scales, uh, which makes the really sort of fundamental understanding of the process quite complicated. Historically, the challenges have been associated, uh, one, with the fact that most of these studies have been qualitative, two, the studies that have, carried out, have been carried out have been carried out in two-dimensional environments that are far from uh, in vivo, and three, there has been very little modeling that incorporates matrix cells and mechanics. So these are the three main challenges that we hope to address in the context of this talk today, specifically in the context of this grant in a broader and a more general sense. Um, Michael, you want to say something about um, cancer biology and sort of go from here? Okay. Uh, speak up a little bit. So, Conventional methods in, in cancer biology and molecular biology has helped reveal a lot about the signaling processes involved in cancer and has provided us a lot of insights towards the mechanisms and the deregulations that happen in cancer and have illustrated, as illustrated in this signaling map. Um, but while a lot of insights have been gained from this, we don't really know a lot about how this translates into mechanical and functional capabilities of cells, which are ultimately fairly important in the metastatic process in which cells must be able to mechanically uh, invade from, from one point to another. So, um, um, uh, in, in other words, what we are interested in, in and, and is illustrated from uh, this uh, picture is uh, processes that are at multiple scales that go all the way from single molecule processes, which include uh, processes at the level of actin polymerization and depolymerization, how this machinery of actin comes together 
pushes the cell forward on one side and on the other ha side how does the signaling component of the cell which is associated largely with binding and unbinding and biochemistry of these processes how do these two interface with each other in pushing the cell forward and eventually leading to processes involved in metastasis so as you can see uh, there is a substantial uh, multiple orders of uh, magnitude um, difference between the processes at the single cell level and at the molecular level and same thing then can be said about the uh, spatial um, difference as well. Yeah, so as Mohammed mentioned, basically the mechanics and dynamics of cancer cells are important when it comes to a process such as cancer metastasis which ultimately is a, a mechanical transport process in which the tumor cell must break free from its primary tumor and then invade across a often very stiff extracellular matrix in the tumor stroma and then intravasate and extravasate against very tight endothelial junctions. So the mechanical properties of, of these cancer cells conceivably should be very important. And recent work has indeed shown that um, metastatic cancer cells seem to have a, uh, a mechanical phenotype associated with it. For instance, in, in this study, okay, in this study they show that um, metastatic cancer cells tend to generate larger traction forces. And they also show that uh, basically substrate stiffness can regulate um, cell morphologies and could promote invasive phenotypes. And additionally, studies using hydrodynamic forces as well as optical forces have shown that cancer cells tend to be softer and more deformable. And finally, more recently, um, in this study they showed that basically purely mechanical environments, mechanical features in the local environment, here dimensionality and directionality can induce, without any externally applied chemical gradients, somewhat complex um, uh, migratory behaviors in cells. So what this tells us is that the mechanical environment and the mechanical features in the cells are worth looking at and are likely to be important in the metastatic process. So today basically I will go over some of the recent work that we've done over the past few months, namely um, we're going to go over some of the experimental work on intracellular microbiology, and, and we're going to go over the... Uh, did we lose the sh uh, screen share somehow? Uh, no, uh, so it looks like someone else is trying to share their screen. Um, please stop sharing. Okay, so I need to keep and everyone else can there. just guide in. Yeah, please stop so sharing guess, your screen. Uh, there we go. So, so the first part of the, the conversation today is going to be experimental studies uh, in microbiology, looking at cells in 3D environment. Um, then we'll talk about how this is going to be integrated with modeling and simulations of this behavior. And finally, we'll conclude with how does this connect with our work, ongoing work in higher order length and time scales. Okay, so one of our goals is to create a platform in which we can study the mechanical properties of cancer cells in physiologically mimicking environments. So to start, we would like to use a microfluidic device, basically that's illustrated here, in which we um, can load a gel region in the middle with cells, so we can study cells in 3D, and then we have compartmentalized media reservoirs in which we can, we can control things like interstitial flow or co-culture conditions. So one of the reasons, so basically the way it works is we can load the gel into the middle and due to surface tension, the gel would be compartmentalized there. So then we can then cont separately control the media reservoirs on the top and bottom. And we can embed cells in these gels and then we can also inject them with nanoparticles so we can study their uh, mechanical properties in 3D. Um, and one of the reasons why we want to do this in a microfluidic environment is so that we can have more precise control um, over over the environmental features. So recent work from, from the CAM lab has shown that we can apply interstitial flow, we can apply chemical gradients, as well as co complex co-culture conditions 
in this type of platform of devices. Uh, and these are typically much more difficult in conventional well-played formats. Um, so, so now that we're able to culture these cells in these uh, environments, we're interested in being able to study the local mechanical properties. So to do this, we use uh, microrheology. And we've done both nanoparticle tracking rheology as well as, more recently, we started looking into mitochondria tracking. So here you see a cell that's uh, expressing actin GFP and stained with a mitochondria label that's red. So what we can do is then just trace these intracellular particles and from that produce the mean square displacements to get a sense of the local fluctuations. So what we do is that we measure the fluctuations of these particles in a plane and then we um, we noticed that there were some anisotropic motions, so what we do is we rotate the coordinate axis for each particle so that we get a maximum ratio between the 1D mean square displacements in each of the principal directions that we're interested in. So that's what you see as the blue and the green curves. So these are the directions of maximal and minimal fluctuations. Um, and then from the mean square displacements, we can convert using the generalized Stokes-Einstein relation to the complex shear modulus so shown here, the green is the, the elastic modulus and the red is the loss modulus in each of the two principal directions. Um, so what we see is that these cells are typically very stiff or, or solid-like, um, but it's worth noting that at lower frequencies, the data becomes unreliable due to, or the conversion becomes unreliable due to active fluctuations, which I'll go into in some detail a little bit later. And because we typically cells have a large number of mitochondria, we can create these spatial maps of the um, of the share of the mechanical properties in each cell shown here. So the idea now is is to for us to investigate the impact of the environment around the cell, specifically mechanical effects. Um, and the first thing we looked into is dimensionality. So conventionally studies have been done in 2D, but more recent work has shown that um, in 3D cells tend to behave differently. Uh, specifically, their migratory behaviors are different, their, morphologi their morphological phenotypes are different, and there's also differences in signaling pathways. So that's why we're interested in trying to understand uh, on the intracellular level, what's different? What's uh, what? What's the effect of dimensionality between 2D and 3D? So what we did was that we studied um, the we did microbiology of cells uh, in 2D, and we did it in 3D, and we compared the mean square displacements, the local fluctuations. So here you see are the results. Basically, what you see here is that as the time interval increases, uh, 2D data becomes uh, uh, 2D cells have high, larger internal fluctuations, um, suggesting that they're softer. And also, they have larger logarithmic slopes. So we can also look at the slopes by taking the logarithmic time derivatives. And what we see is that um, in 2D, the logarithmic time derivatives are, uh, are larger for, for these cells compared to 3D. So what this means is that typically, um, if if the derivative is zero, if beta is equal to zero, that's a solid-like material, and when it approaches one, it becomes fluid-like. So cells in 2D appear to be more fluid-like. Uh, and then next, so we found basically what we see is that the mechanical, the local mechanical properties of cells between 2D and 3D appear to be distinct. So now we're one of the interests in, in creating these platforms is so that we can screen for drugs that would target mechanical properties of cells. And what we're interested in, in knowing is whether or not cells would respond differently if, if the dimensionality is different. So to test this, we basically we disrupted the cytoskeleton of the cells using cytokalicin, which, um, which basically uh, prevents active polymerization from happening. So what you see here is that in 3D, if you look at the internal fluctuations, 
we see that initially there does appear to be a stiffening of the network at short time intervals once you treat it with cytokalism. But the trends are comparable between three uh, in 3D when you treat it. And same thing if you look at the logarithmic derivatives, so the cell does not appear to change too much in 3D. But then if we look at cells in 2D, what we see is that again we see a what appears to be a more pronounced um, decrease in the fluctuations, so the network stiffens up even more. And then if you look at the logarithmic derivatives, we see that the there's a much more pronounced effect due to cytokalism D treatment. So this suggests that um, that the cells respond to drugs differently in 3D and 2D. And if we're interested in physiological responses, uh, we likely should be moving towards 3D studies. And here are some typical uh, fluorescence images showing what happens to untreated cells and to cytokalism treated cells. Um, so what you see is that when you treat it with cytokalism, the inter intracellular network essentially collapses. Um, and this likely is what's causing the initial uh, increase in, in local stiffness because the, the actin co local actin concentrations become more aggregated and, and larger. Um, but you do see morphologically in 3D and 2D there may be some differences. Okay, so next we, I'll talk a little bit about the computational lab analysis that we've done and how that ties in ultimately with some of these experimental work. Um, so uh, the idea is that we do Brownian dynamic simulations of active actin networks. So basically we have a three-dimensional domain as shown here in which we have actin filaments that are polymerized from actin monomers. So this is shown in the blue. And then we have cross-linkers, which are yellow, and motors, which are orange. So cross-linkers, these cross-linkers are mechanosensitive uh, and uh, have, a, have a mechanosensitive binding and unbinding rates. And motors, basically, they bind to multiple filaments, and then they walk towards the barbed ends and thus create tension across the network. So one thing we investigated was, or we tried to investigate, was the impact of dimensionality, because that was one of the focuses of the experimental work. And to do this, basically, uh, for a 3D network, what we simulated was um, a 3 by 3 by 3 micron domain with periodic boundary conditions. And then to simulate 2D, essentially, we have periodic boundary conditions in the x and y directions, but we have fixed boundaries in the z direction. And we also made it flatter, so this is only 1 micron thick, as shown here. So what we found was that, so we measured the internal stresses of these networks, and what we found is that um, for, so in, so this is, in 3D is on the left, what we see is that the, so the red is the fluctuation in the Z direction, or the stress values in the Z direction, green and blue are the stress fluctuations in the X and Y directions. So what we see is that when we go from 3D to 2D, there are increased um, increased stress fluctuations in the X and Y directions, and also the Z direction the stresses appear to be suppressed. And if we continue to decrease, if, if we decrease the uh, the length of the Z dimension, the height of the Z dimension to, to 500 nanometers, we actually get even increased, even more increased uh, stress fluctuations, as shown here in the right. So this can be explained by looking at the, the network morphology. Is basically when we fix the two boundaries and as well as shrink the z dimension, what you see is that uh, the network becomes more planarized. So the fluctuations are now, and, and the motor activity is now basically enhanced in the x and y directions. So basically to try to understand what the effect this has on, on the um, internal fluctuations of cells in, the, in different dimensions, we looked into the, this, we created this effective temperature model, uh, which is shown here. Um, so the, sorry, the, I guess the conversion doesn't look great, but essentially we have a, 
effective temperature term here. Basically, um, A is the uh, activity of motors per second. S is the Laplace frequency. And S0 is a characteristic frequency above which, uh, below which the effective temperature term is essentially constant. And this is supposed to show the generalized Stokes-Einstein relation um, with this effective temperature term. So the idea here is that when you have motor fluctuations, you have non-thermal effects that's going to impact the uh, internal fluctuations and, as well as the generalized Stokes-Einstein relation, which prevents you from accurately uh, calculating the shear modulus at low frequencies. Um, but if we include an effective temperature term, then we can try to account for those, those effects. So first, let's assume an elastic material in which the shear modulus is constant. And, and so the generalized Stokes-Einstein simulation becomes something like this. And if we take the Laplace transform, we can create, basically get a form factor like this. And you can get similar form factors for um, viscous materials as well as for power law uh, viscoelastic materials. And so with this form factor, we can then try to plot what happens when we increase motor activity, when motor activity is enhanced, for instance, by dimensionality. And as you can see, basically, we can, we can capture the uh, effect that we're seeing uh, in our experiments. So basically, in 2D, in which you have enhanced motor activity, you get this increase in the mean square displacement at longer time intervals, as well as an increase in beta, so a more what appears to be more fluid-like fluctuations. And then if we, so this is consistent with our experimental results. And if we look at the uh, frequency spectrum of the mean square displacement, basically you get these trends. Um, so the this is the slope of the top lot black line is the slope of two, and the bottom line is the a slope of one. And these trends are again consistent with um, the literature, suggesting that this effective temperature, the simple effective temperature model, is able to capture uh, what's happening. Okay, so. Next, we're interested in basically trying to understand what are some of the intracellular mechanical parameters that are going to affect the uh, local cell properties. So what we do here is we, we do these Brownian dynamic simulations in periodic boundary conditions. And we varied the motor concentration and the concentration of actin cross-linking proteins. Um, so what essentially what you see here is that as you increase motor concentrations, you get an increase in the shear modulus. And, and as you increase the cross-linking concentrations, you also get an increase in shear modulus. And at the same time, you get a decrease in the phase lag, which means that the, the material is becoming stiffer and more solid-like as you increase motor and cross-linker concentrations. So this is interesting because inside cells, typically, they do not have homogeneous distributions of cross-linkers and motors. Um, so by understanding how these factors into local stiffnesses and stresses, we can better understand the local mechanical state of, of cells. Um, and as we, we did these simulations, what we found was that oftentimes um, internal stresses uh, cannot be sustained by these networks, especially when motors are walking and they're very active. So what we investigated was into the impact of polymerization dynamics and how internal stresses are affected by polymerization rates of actin, as well as how the network morphology is affected by polymerization rates. So what we found was that if the actin is polymerizing very quickly, then the motors do not have enough time to, to walk and generate sufficient stresses, so you get in very low internal stress levels. But if the motors are walking slightly more quickly, uh, sorry, if the polymerization rate increases, then what you see here is an increase in the stress levels that are generated by the motors. 
But if we continue to decrease the polymerization rate, we actually see that the stress level continues, does not continue to increase, but rather the, it starts to decrease after a certain threshold. So this is interesting to us because um, so what we saw was that when, when, the polymerization, when the polymerization rates of actin is low, the, the motors which generate large tensions actually reorganize the, the cytoskeletal networks as shown here by our, our simulations. And we get these formations of superstructures and aggregates of actin and motors and crosslinkers. And this is, so this recent work using purified actin networks shown here, that when they, so basically red is actin and yellow and, and green is, um, are the motors, actin, uh, myosin motors. So what they do here is they, they uh, sustain a constant level of ATP in the system so that motors are walking consistently in this actin network. And over time you see these aggregates forming. So this is consistent with what, with what we're showing. Uh, basically that, that these active stresses are able to reorganize the network and create these superstructures. Um, but what we show is that if we modulate the polymerization rates, we can actually change these morphologies. And this is also, so from our own experimental work, we have cells that are untreated, and then we treat the cell with cytokalasin D as we, as we showed previously. And what you see is that cytokalasin D actually inhibits actin polymerization um, by, by capping actin proteins at the barbed end. So that, so basically, essentially, they're reducing the actin polymerization rates. And what you see is that they start to form these super aggregates as well, which is what our simulations are able to predict. So um, Michael has been talking about over the last um, 25 minutes or so, uh, events at the molecular level or perhaps uh, at molecular complexes. What I want to talk in the next perhaps 10 minutes or so is how are we connecting these to higher order length scales and um, I hope uh, that it will give you a flavor of the kinds of things, <coughs> excuse me, that we plan on doing through this uh, grant and the, through this consortium. So um, we have been over the last several years looking at uh, cell migration as uh, sort of a process in 3D environments and we've used a multitude of tools ranging from Monte Carlo simulations to much more detailed finite element methods to look at how cells move. In this case what I'm going to just show is, is some of our work uh, where we have explicitly simulated individual fibers and what happens when cells uh, uh, sort of reorganize those fibers. So in this sort of cartoon we see one of four possibilities. So either the cells can deposit a fiber in three-dimensional environment, it can move a fiber, it can sort of, uh, sorry, it can, it, it cannot, it may, it may not do anything, uh, it can sort of push a fiber in a different direction or the cell may move itself. And what we've done is you've taken uh, confocal reflectance microscopy images and have then, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, used those images to create detailed structure of fibers looking at individual fibers, their cross-linking, their uh, sort of uh, geometry and their concentration in 3D environments and we've sort of matched those with what we see in experiments and here we, what we're trying to do is sort of take what Michael has shown at, at the molecular level machinery and connect it with uh, the cellular level behavior in 3D. So we want to do all of these things in a three-dimensional environment. When it comes to addressing, looking at uh, migration of cells in 3D, we have to understand what is the relationship between 3D cell migration and adhesion between receptors. Here we are using a statistical mechanics model to understand that. Um, just a cartoon to show what we do here is if you think of uh, a cell that attaches to a 3D environment or even perhaps a 2D environment uh, from a statistical mechanics per perspective, adhesion can be described in a, sort of a uh, with, with a three-part uh, model. In the first case, we have confirmation of adhesion receptors. So these can be integrins, these can be cluster of integrins, these can be focal adhesions that bind to the ligands in specific conformations. And we can do those, uh, again, using molecular dynamics or Brownian dynamics simulations looking at those conformations. The second category of things is the surface coverage. And I'll come to that in a few minutes as well of how that changes as a function of curvature and how that changes 
as a function of three-dimensional environment. The third one is the interactions between receptors and ligands. So the ligands here can be soluble ligands, the ligands can be here tethered ligands, and what we do here is we use a mean field approach to look at uh, these interactions. These are a combination of Van der Waals interactions, electrostatic interactions, um, as well as uh, ex uh, explicit interactions that we can incorporate, such as hydrogen bonding and other things. If you look at the adhesion simulations, we can sort of divide the adhesion free energy into two categories. Uh, there's a sort of a positive internal energy and a negative entropy. Um, the internal energy is basically a function of these interactions that I talked about. That includes the Van der Waals interactions, hydrogen bonding, and, and similar things. The entropic contribution comes from solvent. If it is a, uh, a solvent-based system, uh, such as you have soluble ligands, it comes from conformational entropy. It also comes from translational entropy and, and, and sort of uh, the fact is that there could be entropic interactions due to uh, the fact that these receptors may be too close to each other, uh, negative uh, interactions when they, when they get very close to each other. Uh, what we show here in, in uh, sort of a, a normalized free energy uh, uh, is basically pairwise interaction. So imagine A is my surface protein, B is my ligand of type of particular type, C is a ligand of another type. So basically what we are looking at here is probability distribution functions that, inter that show the interactions between A and B, B and C, and so on and so forth. Now, the second aspect of this is looking at integrin clustering. Integrin clustering um, has been studied uh, to some extent in 2D, but in 3D it's actually quite interesting because it's a factor of not only the curvature of the cell, but also the availability of collagen fibers. So in a, in a, in a two-dimensional environment, you can imagine it to be an infinitely long collagen fiber, infinitely wide, and clustering is driven by that. In 3D, it's driven by the size and shape and density and cross-linking of the collagen fiber. And what we note here is that it is driven both by dimensionality and the thickness of the collagen fiber. So in the uh, bottom right figure, what you notice is uh, in 2D is this right axis, this dashed blue line, that clustering is a lot higher um, than, let's say, an individual small thin fiber in 3D, and that as the fiber thickness increases, so does the clustering, but it is much higher in, in, in 2D. And that addresses one of the major sort of uh, uh, challenges that has been, um, uh, I mean, that, that has been going on. What is the size of focal adhesions in 2D versus 3D? Why do we see much bigger clusters in 2D than in 3D? And here what we are doing is we are looking at these interactions and we are saying it is driven by both the conformation as well as the dimensionality, and that's what determines the size and shape of the focal adhesion. Now, when we compare our results between experiments and simulation here, uh, what we see is we see a very good comparison overall to looking at uh, both the migration as well as the deposition of the fiber, which comes from the Monte Carlo simulations. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go into the detail of all of those things, but, but this was one of the papers that we looked at, uh, where we looked at some of this behavior um, last year. And briefly speaking, what we are seeing here is uh, when we did the experiments in looking at how the cells are depositing matrix fibers and how we are seeing that in simulation. What we did then was we looked at cancer cells of different types and at different stages. DU145s are cancer cells of um, later stage, uh, prostate cancer cells. NNCAPs are cancer cells of an earlier stage. And here we are looking at collagen concentration in 2, 3, and 4 mix per mil. And we do a reasonable job in comparison between the matrix that is laid down by uh, cells both in simulation and experiment, except in low, very low concentrations. And partly the reason is because the uh, uh, experimental uh, conditions can be highly heterogeneous in 3D, um, at, at very low concentrations, it's often hard to get a comparison uh, between uh, experiment and simulation. Now, we are also looking at, and again, as, as I mentioned earlier, this is a work in progress in, in, in uh, connecting with what Michael is doing with with behavior at a cell level, what we're also looking at is uh, the behavior of how cells move in 3D and how the elongation that is often attributed to uh, sort of the, the uh, let's say, the, the step of the cell where uh, lamellopod is involved and it sort of stretches and how sort of it contracts in 3D environments and whether we can connect that um, with Michael simulations as well as experiments. In this case, we are looking at the behavior of rho kinase and uh, here you see that in the absence of rho kinase, the cell has a very strong uh, round bottom as it moves forward. 
And we can capture that behavior using finite element simulations um, where we are able to capture, again, this sort of a round bottom and sort of a, this jagged um, behavior that the cell sees. Again, these are very early simulations where we can capture some of this behavior, uh, which is more like amoeboid migration in a three-dimensional environment. So uh, we recognize that we need to finish by 4.30, and we want to leave some time for discussion and questions. So I'll end here. Uh, with there are basically four main conclusions here. First of all, at the molecular level, what we're seeing is that by using integrated computational experimental microbiology, we can help to understand uh, intracellular mechanics of cancer invasion. This includes basically understand, developing new methods uh, using mitochondrial rheology, using microfluidic environments, as well as doing microbiology in, that in, in those environments, which are fairly high throughput, to understand what exactly is going on as the cells are migrating in complex 3D matrix. The second factor that we know is something that we are very interested in is that microenvironmental factors, such as dimensionality, going from 2D into 3D, can alter the intrinsic mechanical properties uh, that lead to more invasive behavior. That means that if you focus exclusively on 2D, then uh, most likely you will sort of be able to uh, miss some of the key features that are contributing to cell um, uh, migration in 3D environments. Uh, cytoskeletal regulatory proteins are altered in many of the aggressive cancers, and we are certainly looking at that. And finally, integrating over higher order length scales, where we have been looking at uh, the behavior of cells moving as a whole, can provide insights into cellular migration in 3D and invasion of um, various cancers. In this particular case, uh, in this grant, we are looking at breast cancers, and in particular, MENA expressing breast cancers. And as we go along, hopefully, we'll keep you updated as to how incorporating cell signaling, growth factor signaling, um, and uh, connecting that with behavior such as microbiological properties at various parts of the cell and how that contributes to overall stiffness in various parts of the cell and eventually overall migration. Anything else, Mike, uh, Michael? All right, so with that, we'll leave it up uh, to you guys for any questions, discussions, and looking forward to your, your input. Thanks for thanks for much, Mark. I, I will uh, grab the first question then. <laughs> this is so I'm, I'm really intrigued by these oscillations that you see. And can you say a little bit more about how those progress as a cell uh, becomes more more uh, comfortable with with this environment? If you do these do these oscillations that you observe persist into throughout a steady state, or does the cell mature out of them? Are you talking about oscillations in the stress fluctuations? Or what oscillations are you talking about? So the, 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 the stress, even, even just these oscillations that you saw, showed right at the very beginning by looking at motion of particles within the cells. How, how long do those persist? Uh, so those are steady states. They will persist as long as the cell is alive. So these are mainly, I mean, they're, they're thermally driven at short time scales, but at longer time scales, they're driven by uh, motor activity and internal stress fluctuations. But they will persist as long as the cell is able to uh, continually stay active. And if I could ask this a quick follow-on, did I understand correctly that you understand those to be related to the stress fluctuations that you that you reported later, uh, and that the uh, they're, they're basically arising from the same uh, molecular level interactions. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so, so basically, um, these fluctuations at really short time scales are just due to essentially thermal energy, thermal motion, yeah. thermal, motion uh, thermal fluctuations. But yeah, then, as the long term ones, though. Right. The long term ones. It's been shown um, that it's due to primarily to motor activity. Which ultimately contracts, it causes contractions and, and cross-linker unbinding and things like that in the cell. Um, so you could uh, you can minimize those, for instance, if you suppress uh, if you suppress motor activity. Motor activity yeah. But it's been shown that it's primarily due to these uh, active uh, biomechanical, yeah. biochemical mechanical processes. And their behavior in 3D is quite intriguing because it really is very poorly understood. So while we are interested certainly in, in the cancer context, there are very fundamental questions of how the matrix environment plays a role in regulating these. 
Very good. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments for the speakers? So I have a question. So since this is a, a U01 Cooperative Agreement um, Award from the from the IMAG initiative for multi-scale modeling, what are your plans for um, reaching out to the multi-scale modeling consortiums through this award? Great, great question, Grace. So um, as these simulations are getting developed uh, further, we will share both the algorithms in uh, uh, analysis because there are some some sort of new improved algorithms that we are developing in uh, experimental data analysis, but more importantly on the computational side as they become more developed and, and polished to the point that anybody should be able to use them, they will become uh, available on our website. So we are working on a website where these things individually and collectively will be available for anybody to download um, uh, and, and use them as needed. We recognize that there is a lot of interest in looking at subcellular mechanics uh, as well as modeling migration so these will certainly be available from the website. Well, I always tell investigators who apply to this program to find something that they're passionate about that can be only addressed through community input. So are there any pressing issues that you'd like the consortium to help you address? Um, pressing issues scientifically or uh, pressing issues in terms of outreach? Either one. Well, that I think that would require the community input to help you out. I think it would be great to sort of get community's input in seeing how do we get more people um, intrigued and excited about uh, subcellular mechanics. I think there's a lot of interest uh, in the scientific community, but reaching out to people uh, who may be looking at these questions in the context of development, uh, in the context of uh, sort of embryology, in the context of stem cells, there may be something very interesting going on there that they may not have thought about. And that might sort of enrich their own uh, research as well as uh, help us think broadly beyond our specific focus as well. I am personally very interested in looking at the broad reach of the tools that, that we and others are developing in areas historically which have been dominated by experimentalists to, to look whether there are interesting questions in, in, uh, in those arenas. Great, thanks. And I think you have a question on the group chat. Can you see the group chat? Can I see the group chat? I thought uh, I could get it for you, or if Brandon is on the line, you can also speak your question. Where is the group chat? <laughs> we don't have a group. I'll read it for you. The question from Brandon is, do the 2D and 3D environments have the same stiffness, in other words, mechanical properties, and adhesion sites, biochemical properties? Excellent question, and, and, and I'll let Michael answer it, but, but keep in mind that uh, starting off, they have the similar pro uh, properties, but over long periods of time, the cells modify the environments differently. So over a long period of time, the answer would be that we don't know. We try to optimize them as much as possible, but for the sake of uh, experimental control, they have the same properties in 2D and 3D environments. Right, so... Um yeah, we, we, we have the same conditions, but the... Same condition, that's right. The, um, but for 2D, we're currently doing just glass substrates, whereas in 3D, it's in, uh, in, the collagen. in a collagen matrix. But it's been shown that even in collagen substrates in 2D, you do see similar types of trends. So, so one of the things we didn't show today, and I'll be happy to sort of share it with, with, with Brandon, is that we have done experiments by putting cells on top of 2D collagen and in 3D collagen at 2, 3, 4, and 5 mix per mil. And we've done uh, particle tracking rheology, not mitochondrial rheology, but particle tracking rheology, and we do get uh, different answers there. Great. Any other questions, comments for the speakers? If not, uh, this webinar has been recorded and will be available for viewing after it's posted on the YouTube site. So uh, we thank the speakers. Let's thank them virtually. Thank you very much. Thank you for your uh, great presentation. Thanks a lot.